Obviously, this is one of the major issues of our time, and no matter what kind of work we're doing or law we're doing, I think it's essential that we integrate climate change and the crisis we face with the work we're doing, and it really is in putting these issues together uh, that we get the most powerful po possible movements uh, and, and, uh, and robust movements that will really bring the change we need. So I'm going to introduce the five panelists. I think I'll just do it one at a time, because otherwise you won't know the fresh information about them. Uh, they're going to speak just for 10 minutes, and I'm going to be a somewhat rigid timekeeper, because I think in the back and forth between the panelists and the back and forth with the audience, we'll have the most uh, exciting and dynamic time we can. So I'm going to be a little harsh about cutting people off in long speeches. Uh, so we're going to begin uh, with Jerry Boyle, who is an attorney for the National Lawyers Guild in Chicago, uh, a lawyer with decades of experience in civil unrest uh, as an advocate observer and a participant. And Jerry is going to speak about the challenges of defending street activism. Hello. Uh, I'm going to talk about the legal workers at the tactical level. Uh, the tactical level, that's where the rubber hits the road, or more precisely where the activists hit the coal plant or the bank or the pipeline, um, and specifically lawyers, where the action is. But in order to, in order to get a, a, a fix on tactics, you have to understand strategy. And uh, specifically, I mean, you got to know your enemy, and you got to know what you're dealing with. And we're lawyers, so we think in terms of law. But when you're out on the streets dealing with environmentalists, and it's something the environmentalists should understand too, uh, law's just a weapon used by the political authority to oppress you, all right? These aren't really legal issues, all right? These are power issues, and they want to turn them into legal issues. Um, it's really, and this is a tough sell, but I'll do it quickly. Uh, what you're dealing with out on the streets is less a question of the application of law, okay, and more a question of counterinsurgency. Uh, that's the way they analyze it, all right? And, I mean, that's an old history in this country. The weird thing about the United States is, I mean, we've been dealing with domestic counterinsurgency from the Alien and Sedition Act, okay, right up through the USA Patriot Act today. I mean, the ink was hardly dry on the Constitution when Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Act. Um, it's post-colonial pathology. The United States is schizo. We can do really wonderful things when we want to, but never forget that we were a former British colony. And that affects how, like any former colony, we tend to imitate the behaviors of our former colonizer. And that's particularly true of elite subcultures. Um, we were born in rebellion, but we're imperialistic. And that's not just overseas, it's also here at home. Human rights don't begin or end at the U.S. border. Um, many of you may be familiar with COINTELPRO. This is not new, okay, the counterintelligence program that the federal government used on people like Bernardine back in the 60s and 70s. They don't use that name anymore, all right? But they're still doing it, all right? Um, they have a different paradigm now because the military has a different par paradigm for counterinsurgency. Um, I'll be really quick with this, just so you don't think I'm paranoid, all right? Um, This is a book called The Advent of Net War. Net War, remember that. Just remember the word. It's, um, it's a study by the Rand Institute on how to operate counterinsurgency operations. And what they mean by net war is networked war, dealing with networked organizations. One of the fascinating things about that study it's a, actually a pretty good study of counterinsurgency. As an Irish Republican, it made me nervous. Um, for them, an NGO is an NGO. Uh, in this book, they deal coextensively, whether it's the Irish Republican Army or the international campaign to ban landmines. An NGO is an NGO. 
Okay. Follow-up study. Networks and net wars. This is where they explicitly bring it home. Okay. They're no longer talking about foreign countries. They're talking about the battle in Seattle. They're talking about critical mass. They're talking about applying these principles here. And then very briefly, to bring it even closer to home, this is what they use to train our riot police here. All right? And if you read through this, you find net war key players. And the analogies they use. The Battle of Thermopylae, where 300 Spartans held off the Persian hordes. Well, that makes the police the 300 uh, Spartans and we're the Persian whores, wars. Um, we're, they're not treating us according to law. They're treating us according to counterinsurgency. That's the important thing to understand. Law is just one weapon they use, okay, to control us, all right? Um, you know, during NATO, a lot of people were surprised to see that um, the, the police units organizing their response were organized crime and gang enforcement. Okay, well, yeah, a bunch of activists were getting explicitly what the NGOs out in the neighborhoods, the so-called gangs, get every day. That, too, is counterinsurgency. It's not law. All right. So back to tactics. For a lawyer, first thing to remember is we don't do presentation. We do representation. We don't present. We represent. On any given action, you're either a lawyer or an activist. You can't do both at the same time. As lawyers, you have to resist the temptation to do both at the same time. Um, some of us do activism. I've done some activism. I mean, there's Earth First Journal. That's me. You might recognize the gray hair, all right? But when I go out on the street wearing one of these, that's it. I'm a lawyer. I'm not participating in the action with you. I'm representing you, all right? Um, there's good reasons for this. Uh, what younger lawyers will think is, well, there's a legal risk that you're going to be a co-conspirator. Who cares? Um, that's not my concern, at least. More importantly, we bring objectivity to the table. Uh, the most important value a lawyer brings to the activist community is objectivity. You can't make an objective judgment if you're actively participating. Um, you have to be able to step back and understand how your clients will be judged by those in power. You have to get into the heads of the cops. You have to think like they do and understand what motivates them. <clears throat> also very important for the lawyer is respect for client agency. Clients make the choices. The lawyers don't. We can explain legal consequences of choices, but the clients have the agency. If it was up to us, okay, we'd be running the actions. Depending on the lawyer, nobody would be breaking any laws. Okay? And that's not the way it's supposed to work. You tell us what you want to do. We tell you your risks. We do our best to try to let you do what you want to do without interference from the state. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, just to finish up, um, in terms of the tactical way of dealing with them on the street, at least I, I use what they use on you, okay? Which is a thing they call the matrix for the use of force, all right? Which is actually pretty simple. As far as a lawyer goes, is three levels on the use of force. Physical presence, verbal direction, empty hand control. Cops, they'll go to intermediate weapon systems and lethal force. All right. Representation is triangulation. It's the oldest trick in the book. It's good cop, bad cop. 
And when I arrive on a scene, I identify the officer in charge. I walk up to him and say, hi, Officer Jerry Boyle. I represent these people. What have I just done? I've done physical presence, verbal direction, empty hand control. I got two steps ahead of them. Activists can do that too. Um, but understand that the use of force begins when the police arrive on the scene. A show of force is a use of force. A command is a use of force. Most of us don't think that force is applied until you put your hands on somebody. That's not true. Uh, sum it up that as lawyers, the question we ask after an action is, were the clients able to do what they want to do without interference from the state? If we can answer that question, yes, it's a tremendous success. We usually can't do that, especially on an action where people are trying to get arrested. But if we can get them as close as possible to yes, we've done our jobs. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you're all thinking about questions and things you want to interrogate so we can have a lively discussion. Next, we're going to hear from Kevin Gastala. He's a journalist for firedoglake.com. Uh, write that down or tap it in. Uh, Kevin regularly covers civil liberties and national security issues and has written extensively about information released by WikiLeaks. He will talk about transparency and also the sabotage of the Copenhagen climate talks by the Obama administration. Kevin. So uh, most people out in this audience are hopefully aware that there was this organization called WikiLeaks uh, and its editor-in-chief, Julian Assange, got its hands on a cache of documents back in uh, 2010 and began to release U.S. state embassy cables, which were diplomatic cables that showed the ways that uh, diplomacy was being conducted by the United States government. Um, and it... Basically, the cache that was released of over 250,000 cables presented the, the Bush administration along with the first couple, um, the first year or so of the Obama administration. And, and inside, what people were able to get a glimpse at was what many who had covered and participated in the Copenhagen climate talks had in fact suspected, which is that there were underhanded dealings going on, people were being blackmailed, there was a level of spying happening at this conference, and there was some conspiracy going on among uh, perhaps powerful countries to make sure that the goals for an agreement were lower than perhaps what the European Union wanted or perhaps what the developing countries in Latin America and uh, other parts of the world were willing to aspire to achieve. And... I'll just read you a, a statement that the deputy special envoy, his name is, uh, his last name was Pershing, and he said at the climate change negotiations that the United States is extremely pleased to be here at COP15 in Denmark. We are committed to achieving the strongest possible outcome in the next two weeks. The world community has here in Copenhagen the opportunity to reach a deal that could move us much more aggressively down the path to meeting one of mankind's greatest challenges and to speed the transition to a low carbon global economy. Well, what happened with the release of these cables was that you could tell that this was just complete nonsense, that the United States had in fact not pushed for the strongest agreement possible. Um, and what it showed is that there was in fact an effort by people to use the United Nations to spy on China, France, Japan, Mexico, Russia, and the European Union, and to get biographical details on these people, to get their credit card, to get frequent flyer numbers, um, to uh, find ways that they could 
uh, get intelligence on climate negotiations, uh, for, for, for example, such as, quote, efforts by treaty secretariats to influence treaty negotiations or compliance, end quote. And, uh, and one of the things that was so amazing is that this is how John Vidal, the Guardian Environmenter, Environment Editor, described it. He said, by seeing these cables, we've lifted the lid on what actually happens at conferences like that, and we've begun to see the kind of intense pressures and arm twisting and blackmail and different tactics which have always been used by the rich countries over poor countries. The only new thing now is that it we actually have it written down. We can see it for the first time with our own eyes. So what you know, we tried to report two, th two years ago, three years ago, we now actually know. And I think that Bolivia and other countries' reaction has been very, very interesting because that's the outrage that they've had, how rich have been bullying and press gaying the poor. Uh, in fact, uh, Bolivia's president, Evo Morales, didn't mince words. He said what people were seeing was the diplomacy of empire. Um, in fact, one example, um, you know, to get a little more into this, it showed that the United States had in fact been threatening to remove aid to certain countries if they did not agree to uh, participate in the way that they wanted to go about this conference. So for example, they would approach a small country like Maldives that uh, if the rising sea level gets too high, they would be non-existent anymore, say, if you still want to have aid, uh, you should comply uh, and do this to multiple different countries. Um, and you know, basically had Senator Kerry go to China and make this kind of, um, of, of an alliance, an, un, an unspoken alliance with China to say that we were going to agree to a much lower agreement you know, on the basis that by doing this, we could open up some kind of economic opportunities, perhaps in the future. Uh, moving on, I just, you know, WikiLeaks' releases weren't exclusive to the climate uh, talks. So I just wanted to mention before I um, wrap my talk here that, uh, in fact, it did show that the BP Corporation had suffered a blowout on an Azerbaijan gas platform that was very similar to the Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster that everyone remembers vividly from the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, it, it showed uh, in that instance in Azerbaijan that that was the result of a bad cement job. Uh, I think that's sort of uh, part of what was going on with uh, the, the Transocean. And uh, it's actually bad cement job is something that has come up many times when you've had these sort of disasters. Uh, you also had in the release uh, a very, very stark uh, glimpse at the fact that there is going to be this kind of cold war over resources in the Arctic between Russia, between these countries uh, in NATO. Uh, was, uh, in, the, in 2009, the US was told that the 2007 mission by the Russian explorer Chilangarov to place a Russian flag on the seabed beneath the North Pole was ordered by Putin's party. Now, that was something that was in the cables. Russian ambassador to NATO, Dmitry Rogozin, told a Russian TV station, quote, the 21st century will see a fight for resources and Russia should not be defeated in this fight. NATO has sensed where the wind comes from, it comes from the north. And uh, this was just, you know, it, it, it threw everything off and you could see that people are going to be clamoring for these resources rather than taking the opportunity as a result of the Arctic melting to make some kind of an effort to combat climate change you're actually going to see these countries instead saying, sensing there's this opportunity for a kind of gold rush to go after the different oil and, and gas resources, which is just going to make this more worse. So you had um, organizations like Greenpeace taking initiatives. Um, and to wrap up, I would just add that the, uh, you know, what I'm really talking about here is how people in the audience can start to use transparency or, or how others in the world can use transparency and, and perhaps engage in what could be called information activism so that there could be some way to go after and, and combat climate change. Because what you really have happening is the, you know, the private corporations and the government working together are concealing what is going on. But 
through the Freedom of Information Act, there's a lot that can actually be gleaned. Uh, in fact, you recently had a judge out in Colorado order um, the exposure uh, or the release of, uh, of some records that would show where uh, some of these companies want to begin doing fracking. Um, and this was something that they were fighting, but, uh, if you're ha but they have the U.S. Bureau of Land Management is involved in this process. And so the fact that you have a U.S. government agency that's involved, it means that the records are supposed to be available to the public in some way. So that's a, lot of, that's a lot of power that we have. So long as there is this cozy relationship between corporations and government, it's bad because, uh, because you have the kinds of revolving door, you have the politics that does not uh, result in any meaningful action on climate change. On the other hand, if you want to know what's going on and you have that cozy relationship, it actually benefits in a way because these government officials know almost everything that the corporations are doing. And if it was just limited to the corporations, they can make a claim that they have some privacy. And those are records you and I aren't ever going to be able to read. But because government officials have an idea that this is happening, then, uh, and because they've been involved, because these agencies have been involved in covering up, because you have like the State Department who is at least uh, privately pushing along the Keystone XL pipeline, even though they know that there's a lot of opposition to it as it's being built in Texas um, and is going to become this 500 mile long monstrosity, uh, you, you know that uh, we have a, a lot of power because as journalists or even as citizens, we can make these uh, submissions uh, for under the Freedom of Information Act to have released these documents that we could figure out what was going on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, now we're going to hear from Carrie Leiderson. Uh, Carrie is an environmental journalist, a Chicago-based journalist and professor who is fresh off a fellowship studying climate change and mining at the University of Colorado. She's the author of several books. She teaches journalism at Columbia College, and she teaches at the School of the Art Institute. She's written extensively on environmental damage of coal-powered plants in Chicago's Little Village community. She is going to talk about legal tactics being used to oppose the U.S. coal industry's push in response to federal environmental regulations and competition from natural gas. So she's going to talk about the coal industry's push to develop sweeping infrastructure to export coal to power plants in China where U.S. laws and regulatory efforts do not apply. Carrie. Yeah, so I'll, I'll focus um, pretty specifically on this uh, issue that's going on that's huge in the West and the Pacific Northwest. I'm not sure. Um, it doesn't get as much attention on a national level, so I'm not sure if people here have heard as much about this. But um, basically, people probably have heard that uh, coal plants are closing at a pretty rapid clip. There's been over 100 that have closed in the past couple years. And the reasons that they're closing, part of it is federal environmental regulations, which are stricter than we've had in the past. There's a mercury rule that kicks in in 2015 and some other laws. And then um, cheap natural gas um, from fracking is, is probably the primary reason that a lot of these plants are closing. And just a quick um, legal related note on that, fracking as of now is um, very lightly regulated. The oil and gas industry in general have exemptions from a lot of the federal laws that govern other sectors like the Clean Water Act and the, um, the uh, actually fracking in particular has an exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act. So anyway, that's one of the reasons that, that gas is cheap and hence that coal plants are going out of business. Um, so because of all these coal plants closing, the coal, in move further away, sorry, <laughs> is this okay? Um, so the coal companies, and Peabody in this case is, is the big driver, and also other ones are looking to drum up new markets so they can keep selling their product, and they're looking to China where there's massive demand for coal. China has a ton of its own coal, but it still needs more, and actually, China can actually, it looks like, um, potentially get coal from the U.S. more cheaply than it can get coal from some of its own regions because it doesn't have the um, rail infrastructure to get coal from where it is to where it's needed. So anyway, as of now, um, there, really, there are no ports in the U.S. 
West Coast that export coal. There's one or two in Canada, and, and U.S. coal does go out of those Canadian ports to China right now. But coal companies are pushing to do, right now there's um, proposals for at least five major export terminals in Oregon and Washington that would allow them to much more easily export coal to China and export much more coal to China. Um, and this coal would come from the Powder River Basin, which is this vast deposit in Wyoming and Montana. Um, and this is all on federal land. So this is a, another interesting part of the story. The companies like Peabody and I think Arch and other companies are getting this coal on federal land and paying um, essentially a lease and royalty fees to the government for it. But there's been a, a bunch of studies showing that it's really undervalued. They're paying the government a lot less than the coal is actually worth. And um, already the government, you know, the taxpayers have lost uh, 30 billion just compared to market rates for coal. So there have been pushes to, um, to change that situation and make these companies pay more for the Powder River Basin coal. But those proposals so far haven't gone anywhere, um, you know, I'm assuming because, the, because of the power of some of these coal companies with uh, legislators. Um, so in order to get this coal from the Powder River Basin to these Pacific Northwest ports that they want to build, they'd have to transport it basically 4,000 miles on rail lines. So this would have massive impacts across a big part of the West and through cities, uh, Spokane, Seattle, um, Portland, major cities, uh, Missoula. Um, along the route would, would see really big impacts and also small towns would, would in some ways see even more um, critical impacts because the, depending on the routes and how things pan out, some of these cities and towns could have trains coming by literally every 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and these are coal trains which are longer than your usual trains and um, all trains have, spew a, a pretty significant amount of diesel fumes which cause public health problems. And then the actual coal dust coming off the rail cars is a really serious issue both environmentally and in terms of um, health for nearby residents. And then in a lot of these towns, um, the railroad tracks run right through the center of town. So the towns could be divided in half for actually a sort of significant portion of the day. And that's especially um, troublesome when you think of the fact that emergency rooms or you know, hospitals, fire departments, police departments might be on one side of the tracks and the school and residents might be on the other side. So, um, there's a real big concern, concern about emergency response if you have this constant flow of coal trains. Um, and then there's uh, definitely impacts on wildlife and all sorts of ecological impacts. And that's just the rail I've been talking about so far. Once you get to the ports, um, again, big ecological impacts. Um, a herring fishery in the Puget Sound area that had been basically wiped out or ne nearly wiped out and then sort of um, rejuvenated could be wiped out again, um, ecologists say, if they build these new ports there. And it's a big uh, salmon fishery. And, and one thing I'll talk about in a few minutes is the tribal aspects of the situation. Um, the salmon fishery there is really crucial to the entire existence and culture of a lot of Native American tribes in the Pacific Northwest. And the salmon could um, be seriously impacted by these coal terminals. So in terms of the legal recourse that people have with the rail lines, there's not a lot because they're federally regulated and it's just really hard to fight anything to do with the rail line. And they are um, existing rail lines, they'd be expanded, but it's not like there's new, besides maybe small spurs, it's not like major new rail lines are being built. Um, the, there is more legal recourse around the actual ports. That's where the Army Corps needs to give different permits and um, local zoning bodies do have some power. Um, and then uh, I think for all the ports, whenever there's federal land involved um, or government land and resources involved, there's a, a NEPA um, requirement that you have to do an environmental study. And there's sort of two types of these environmental studies. There's an environmental assessment, which is pretty basic and doesn't go into much depth. And then there's an environmental impact statement, which is more comprehensive. And then what the um, residents and opponents of coal exports are demanding is that they do not only the more comprehensive environmental impact statement, but also a regional one that takes into account not just the impact around this port, but the impact um, ideally going all the way out to the Powder River Basin or you know, looking at the, the rails and all the related um, things. So that's one struggle is to get to force the companies to do the more comprehensive um, study. 
and uh, and even that um, that law is not necessarily that strong NEPA because even once these studies are done, there's really no binding requirement regarding what is done with the results. So even if you know the results are this is going to be bad, it doesn't mean that the project will be stopped. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the the tribal aspects of this. Um, and actually, let me. these for all five um, for all five of these ports um, for all five of these ports most likely the coal would have to go through the Columbia River Gorge um, mostly on trains and one plan actually calls for it on barges and um, So here's kind of a map of it. You can see where these different proposed ports are. Um, and even the ones in Washington, the trains most likely would go through the Columbia River Gorge before they end up there. Um, so the tribes in this area, this is the tribes do have some extra powers to legally fight this plan. Um, the tribes as part of you know the whole, the treaties that were signed when they gave up huge amounts of land, um, they were given fishing rights both to fish in their accustomed places and then also to actually have fish alive there, you know, uh, sufficient fish um, to carry out fishing and, and to have a, you know, a, an economy based, a microeconomy based on fishing. So just the fact that these coal exports would really impact the fisheries, that gives them a lot of leverage right there. It's basically, they're saying, a violation of their treaty rights to, to um, build these terminals. And then... Uh, um, also, specifically, I visited the Cherry Point area up in the Puget Sound um, where they want to build the terminal there. The Lumi tribe says is on a native burial ground, so um, there's also laws that protect native burial grounds. So that's something that they're trying, that's an angle they're trying to work. Um, and one interesting thing with the, um, with the fishing rights is that there was a, a federal decision um, called the Bolt decision. The, the judge was Judge Bolt. Um, that was actually really strong. It was seen as a huge victory for tribal rights, and that's um, what gives the tribes not only the right to actually fish in their custom places, but to have fish there and to get at least 50% of the take of the fish. Um, so one sort of um, complication is that they don't necessarily want to sue because since there is this great decision already on the books, you know, they don't necessarily want something to go to the Supreme Court and, and take the risk of um, overturning that. Um, so the tribes, if I understand it, I mean, I can't speak for their legal strategy, but the way I understand it is, you know, for starters, they're trying to work um, more in the public realm and, you know, trying to use their moral authority and work with um, environmental groups and, and local residents. Um, so I will just really quickly show a couple pictures. Uh, I, I don't know how well this comes out, but this is a sculpture. Um, the Lu uh, Lumi sculpture showing how the tribe has helped uh, white settlers. This is a, a story about um, how a tribesman had, had um, a, a, one of the tribal members had helped white settlers who were stuck in a canoe log jam and, and would have died <laughs> back um, in the early days. And uh, so anyway, it's, it was just sort of a symbol of how, you know, now the um, industry is screwing the same people over who had, had once helped. Um, I'll just go through this real quickly. This is tracks near the Colum in the Columbia River Gorge where the coal trains would go. Um, this is one of the towns where you can see those logs. That is a train, so that's how close the coal trains would be to the um, to the main street. That is the main street of the town. The train actually goes right down the town's main street, so that could potentially be divided by um, coal trains. You know, about 15% of the time. Um, this is just some of the local residents fighting the. Uh, just show one other picture. This is. Um, the Lumi Nation, they, uh, they had remained silent for a while about their position on the coal export terminal. And then just this fall, um, they made a really big public statement where they took a sort of a faux check 
um, from the company that wanted to build the terminal and burned it and said, not at any price will we sell our, you know, our heritage and our natural resources. So that was a really big deal because it sounded like the company actually thought they would be able to buy off the tribe or, you know, um, steamroll over the tribe. And then they made it very clear in um, September that that wasn't going to happen. So that's probably a good one to end on. Thank you so much. Will that do it? Um, okay, uh, next we're going to hear from Steve Horn. Uh, he's a research fellow for Desmog Balag. Steve uh, was a reporter and researcher for the Center for Media and Democracy. His writing has appeared in The Guardian, Huffington Post, The Nation, Truth Out, and other outlets. He's going to talk today about shale gas, the oil, and how the shale gas oil industry has used the regulatory framework as a weapon to push through its agenda, blocking federal regulations, gutting zoning laws, and helping to ensure that an underfunded state-level regime is incapable of effective regulation, and most importantly, what smart activists are doing uh, to stop that. Uh, my presentation will be as stated on the title, uh, how the oil and gas industry has utilized the framework of the regulatory regime to sort of mostly well shows the veneer of regulations to push through its agenda completely unfettered. Um, talk about some of the devastating consequences of that. Uh, I think the first place to start would be that what this picture actually is of. This picture is of uh, a, a guy that I've been talking to a lot in Texas. His name is Steve Lipsky. Uh, that's actually his water being uh, not being lit on fire. It's uh, laced with methane. And uh, so what happened is the EPA came in after the fact, after this uh, water contamination happened, uh, as sort of a, oh, sorry, uh, we, we allowed this to happen, but we'll help you out. We'll deliver you some water. Uh, after about a year and a half of sort of legal wrangling with the corporation that did that range of resources, uh, you know, the, the case ends up being dropped completely by the EPA uh, in 2012 by the Obama administration. And now this guy, Steve Lipsky, who has a daughter who's two years old, a daughter who's six years old, and a daughter who's seven years old, has this kind of water and pays $1,000 a month for uh, you know, private water. Uh, and this is kind of the, the game plan of the oil and gas industry. So uh, the first question to be asked is, what is fracking? And I'm sure most of you have probably heard of it, so I'm going to go over this pretty quickly. Uh, I'll this out here. So essentially, uh, fracking is different than conventional oil drilling, which is vertical. Uh, you, know, you stick the spigot down, the oil or gas comes back up. With fracking, you have to go deep under the ground, a lot deeper than conventional oil or gas, uh, then go horizontal. and uh, you know, cross pathways with groundwater and uh, hopefully in that process well casing doesn't you know crack a little bit and allow the methane that's that's within gas that's what gas is to go up into aquifers if that you know if your uh, water ends up laced with this methane you end up with what Steve Lipsky had and that's been happening to people around the country and around the world and that's why the movie Gasland got so popular and that's why this is such a big issue and oil and gas industry realizes inherently that this is going to happen with this process. And they need what I'll show is the veneer of a regulatory system to stop it. But what's shown is they know that that can't happen. So we'll go back to 2001 with the Bush administration uh, before the fracking boom took place in the United States. In 2001, uh, the, you know, Cheney had this energy task force which consisted of his Department of State had uh, Secretary of Energy, Department of Interior, pretty much anyone who has a stake in regulating fracking at the federal level, at the international level, uh, had them in, these, in a meeting, a bunch of meetings, several meetings for a few years with oil and gas industry executives. And at this time, uh, you know, this was the buildup for a huge bill that passed in 2005 called the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which I'm sure many of you heard of has something called the Halliburton loophole in it. This allows the oil and gas industry to be exempt from things like Carrie mentioned, the 
uh, Clean Water Act, the Clean, the Clean Drinking Water Act, and uh, you know, essentially, there is no federal regulation of this issue. And on top of that, the chemicals that the oil and gas industry is using uh, are completely exempt uh, because it's, it's considered proprietary under this law. And while show is none of this has changed on the, under the Obama administration, it's actually gotten worse because now it's, this is not only a federal bill, these bills are passing at the state level. So at the state level, uh, it's important to note that bills that are now uh, ALEC or Council of State Government model bills, which I'll explain what those are in a second, uh, a lot of partisans will look at ALEC and say this is a Republican Party entity, this is conservatives. Uh, well, it's important to note that this model bill that ALEC has that is actually the same as the Energy Policy Act 2005 essentially originated uh, in 2011 under the Obama administration. Uh, he, you know, be, for public relations purposes, he had the need to, uh, for his Department of Energy to have a fracking subcommittee where they, quote, studied uh, the impacts of fracking. Well, what happened is this entire thing was stacked with oil and gas officials, just like the Cheney-Bush panel. And uh, there's one environmental representative from the Environmental Defense Fund, which uh, is pretty notorious in the environmental community for taking tons of Wall Street money and uh, basically being like the oil and gas industry's front for its agenda, uh, this green front, greenwashing front. Uh, so Fred Krupp was in that. If you look at who their senior policy advisor is, it's Scott Anderson, who has deep ties to the oil and gas industry. So this uh, you know, subcommittee ends up writing what was just a continuation of what already existed. Uh, and people, you know, a lot of environmentalists were happy about this. And as will be seen, they really shouldn't have been. So this bill, uh, you know, the New York Times ended up revealing, was written by Exxon Mobil. Uh, it's a, now it's the model bill in the state houses that they're using to say, well, look, this is our chemical fluid disclosure bill. Um, here's what we have. This is good. This is how we'll you know, exhibit our best practices uh, in drilling around the country. And you know, what has been seen is actually the results show that this is a complete failure. And I would argue that it was a failure by design the whole time. So a report came out in September of, uh, that's, it should be 2012 actually, uh, Earthworks showed that there's t basically complete under, there's two things going on in, this, in states around the country, uh, under regulation and not, you know, things are not being enforced that are on the books. On top of that, what's on the books, there's such minimal fines for you know, not following regulations that, uh, it, that it's just, I see it as a cost of doing business and it, at that point, there's almost no purpose for regulations because if you look back at what's actually in the bills, um, it was written by them anyway. So this is more of a PR operation. And then this is the year is wrong again, but later on in 2012, uh, you know, even Bloomberg, which is no uh, leftist news source, writes a, an investigative article showing that, uh, again, this bill that I talked about that had huge loopholes in it, they noted, oh, look, it has huge loopholes in it, and um, all these things are happening, especially in the state of Texas. And uh, whoops. So, But I would say that it wasn't a whoops. It was on purpose. That's why the bill was written this way by ExxonMobil. The most important thing to note is the monitor of this whole operation is this company called Frack Focus, which is actually literally a oil and gas industry company uh, run by a PR shop whose clients include you know, people who are associated with the second biggest drill in the United States, Chesapeake Energy. And uh, I've written many times that this was by design. It was not a big secret if you've been following it all along. It started with the Obama administration. Now this is the state, quote, model bill that's being passed in state houses around the country. And then if you look at the international level now, the United States is exporting its uh, exemplary model of how to do fracking around the world uh, with the State Department. On top of that, it's exporting its gas to other countries. Uh, so those are two things to note. 
So what do we do about it? Um, I think the, oops, the important thing to note is uh, we have to get away from the facade of regulations. Um, the oil and gas industry inherently realizes here that it can't be regulated. That's why it has the veneer of regulation, because if it was actually regulated, uh, it couldn't, probably just couldn't happen. So, uh, but you know, it's a little too late once it's already on the ground. You, you, can't be, you can't be regulated. You need to ban it. You need to keep it out of communities. And many uh, different communities around the country are doing this. This was a feature article actually in a really recent edition of The Nation magazine. There's an article called Rebel Towns, and I'll talk about exactly what they're doing. Um, and it's modeled after the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, SELDEF. They've been doing this for like a decade plus. Uh, they don't get very much attention from green groups uh, who are still heavily focused on uh, the ridiculous farce of regulations. So if you look at what uh, SELDEF attorneys have to say about regulations on this slide, uh, it's quite a bit different than what you hear from most green groups in the United States, mainstream green groups. So you look at, uh, this is a quote from Ben Price. He says, uh, you guys can read it, I'm not gonna read it to you, but essentially so the, you know, the quote is that uh, you know, we're just doing ourselves in by believing in this regulatory system. Um, mostly the regulatory system is a game for corporations to push through their agenda. Um, and my example of fracking is just one example. You could probably look across the board and this happens in almost any extractive industry. And CELDEF works on issues across the board, so they have first-hand experience. And so they, they call it like civil disobedience through the legal system, um, not working through the regulatory system, but instead working you know, to just ban things at the town level. And there's still probably problems with this, but if you look at what's happening at the federal level, it's a huge failure, so it's something to think about. Some examples, and actually, I'm glad that Bolivia was brought up before. Uh, this, their model was actually uh, passed in Bolivia, and they have what's called the Nature Bill of Rights. Uh, nature has inherent qualities that you know should be part of uh, when we talk about energy. We should be talking about these things outside of just uh, the framework. Now is what you know, basically, what's in the benefit of corporations with a little bit of regulations. They're saying, well, no, look, nature has. Its own rights, and uh, you know we, we should stop it before any of these rights are uh, attacked. And then one more example is something that's happening, especially in New York right now. It's a big push, at least among more radical uh, grassroots activists, and that's uh, you know, it's something called criminalizing fracking and saying that well, it's a crime to contaminate people's water, contaminate their air, and has all this stuff is written in the bill. It's it's not very mainstream, but uh, there are some groups kind of working on the radical edge who are saying this is one option. Um, if we pass this community by community, it can become state legislation. And it's passed in Woodstock, New York, uh, which has its own history of radicalism. So it's kind of an interesting historical parallel. That's a little bit more about uh, the criminalizing aspect. And there was a good article recently in, on whowhatwhy.com about this, Russ Baker's website. And lastly, um, because the oil and gas industry actually sees this as a big threat, they have a model bill to attack it. Uh, they use the American Legislative Exchange Council to ensure that uh, local governments cannot do anything about oil and, and gas and you know, other extractive industries and regulating them or doing anything about them. Um, and that should be a good sign, actually, that this scares them. And uh, that's pretty much all I have to say for now. so much for cooperating. Thanks, Steve. Um, our last speaker is Brad Thompson. He's a Chicago legal worker who's at the People's Law Office of Chicago. Uh, he's an activist who will speak on current litigation challenging the constitutionality of the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, which has been used to target environmental activists. Thank you. So like Bernadine said, I work at People's Law Office. I work as a paralegal and a private investigator. And our office, uh, our practice is civil lawsuits against the police and also 
criminal defense, particularly for political activists and people otherwise charged from their political organizing or beliefs. And we have a good deal of experience uh, representing environmentalists and animal rights activists. And today I'm going to focus on the criminalization of animal rights, the animal rights movement. And I'm going to do that for two reasons. First of all, I want to emphasize the fact that animal rights is an environmentalist issue and that the, the animal rights movement is not something separate from the environmentalist movement. And in, in particular, animal rights is a climate justice issue and that one of the, a major cause of climate change is animal-based agriculture and one of the simplest things an individual can do to reduce their carbon footprint is to stop eating meat. Also, the second reason is because the government is targeting environmentalists and animal rights activists as part of a same strategy of the criminalization of dissent. In the last few years, we've uh, what we've referred to as the green scare, the criminalization of environmentalists and eco-activists and animal rights have been, animal rights activists have been a part of that. Uh, if people want more information, I'd recommend Will Potter is a journalist who has a blog called Green is the New Red and a book by the same title that really goes into a lot of these issues. And I also just want to emphasize that this isn't a new thing that activists are being labeled as terrorists. Uh, you know, as Bernadine can testify to, or Jerry can testify to about the uh, Irish Republican movement. You know, any, any movement that's unapologetic and effective ends up being targeted by the government and criminalized as terrorists. Specifically today, I'm going to talk about the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. It was previously the Animal Enterprise Protection Act, the APA, which was passed in 1992 and then amended in 2002. And then in 2006, they amended it again and changed the title to the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, or the ATA. And what, that do, what it does is it, criminali it criminalizes any individual who intentionally damages, interferes with, or causes economic damage to a animal enterprise, and also charges for placing an individual associated with an animal enterprise in fear of bodily harm. And when, when in 2006 they changed this, they also added an element for where anyone associated with, any entity associated with an animal enterprise suddenly becomes protected. So that means a tertiary target, so a bank that provides funding to an animal enterprise. And I'm going to read what they, describe, what they define as an animal enterprise here and how long it is. So it's any commercial or academic enterprise that uses or sells animals or animal products for profit, food, or fiber production, agriculture, education, research, or testing. Any zoo, aquarium, animal shelter, pet store, breed or furry, or circus or rodeo, or other lawful competitive animal event, or any fair or similar event intended to advance agricultural arts and sciences. So that's an extremely broad definition of what an animal enterprise could be. And then it also says any entity that does business with any of those things. So it becomes extremely broad and extremely dangerous because of that. Uh, and it has increased penalties where not only are people targeted and labeled as terrorists, but they get sentences of up to life imprisonment uh, or 10 years in prison for something that only causes economic damage and no harm done to any individual. And, and there's some prosecutions that have come under the, both of these uh, acts, and I don't have a whole lot of time to go into the specific facts of each individual prosecution, but I can talk about that during the Q&A or afterwards. I'll stick around if people want to come up, come up and talk to me about those. But the important things to recognize here is that we've seen prosecutions for underground militant activity, so things where Animal Liberation Front claimed actions of liberating animals from farms or labs and arson at businesses that engage in animal exploitation. And what's interesting to note there is that there's already laws on the books against all of those things. And everybody who's charged with those were charged with that and then in addition charged with the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. So it creates, it creates in increased penalties and a broader power for the state to prosecute. And it just empowers the government, the federal government, to, to target even more so. The, then the almost more threatening is the fact that there has been individuals who are above ground activists who are just merely advocating for the liberation of animals, sometimes through 
inflammatory language that is First Amendment protected, but because of their connection to these militant movements, may end up being charged under the APA or the AATA. And so we've seen people who have been charged and in some cases convicted because of activ activity like chanting on a bullhorn, doing demonstrations at people's homes, doing chalking, distributing literature, maintaining websites, doing electronic fax campaigns where you fax a, a, a business that is associated with an animal enterprise. And so it's really dangerous because of how broad the definition can be of what interfering with business could possibly be. And it gets even more dangerous for movements uh, because of the fact that they, there's a conspiracy element to it. You can be charged with conspiring to violate this law, which means that an individual can be charged and convicted when they themselves did not commit any illegal act, and they're just associated with a broad conspiracy defined by the government to break these laws. Um, so it becomes extremely dangerous, and it's one of the reasons it's really important to, for all people concerned about the earth to pay attention to this particular act and the larger strategies by the government. One of the particular things that is echoing a lot of what we've heard already is that this is a perfect example of the collusion between state and corporate interests. You know, this is, as we've heard about ALEC, this was an ALEC model bill that they've tried to increase and to put into state level, at the state level as well. Um, so it's important to recognize that this is a perfect example of the way in which state power and private interests are unified in perpetuating the exploitation of the planet and of, and of animals. So uh, in wrapping up, I want to talk about some of the things that are going on to challenge this, uh, this act. In particular, there was a lawsuit filed called Blum versus Holder. It was a civil lawsuit filed in 2011 by lawyers with the Center, on Con Center for Constitutional Rights out of New York. The lawsuit was filed in Massachusetts on behalf of five animal rights activists. And these are activists that, one, who'd been charged under the prior version of the AATA, the APA, and some that ha had not been charged but are interested in doing above ground public demonstrations, distributing literature, around a whole array of different types of animal welfare and animal liberation issues. The government came back, and the, the lawsuit charged that it's overbroad and vague, that the statute on its face and as applied to these individuals is so broad and so vague in terms of the definitions that are in the, the suit that it's unclear for anybody who's interested in advocating on behalf of animals to know whether or not they could be prosecuted for this. And the impact of that is the chilling effect it has on people's First Amendment free speech, the fact that people end up making choices not to do certain actions that would otherwise be completely legal because of fear that they might be prosecuted under this act. So this lawsuit was filed in 2011. The government filed a motion to dismiss in 2012, um, or in response, and, and in 2012, that was fully briefed and argued in front of the district judge in Massachusetts, in the Massachusetts federal courts. And I'd encourage people to go to the, the CCR website. There's a page that describes the case and has all the briefs listed there. And to check that site for any updates. Because right now, this is the, the most active challenge to the ATA that's happening currently. Uh, and so if and when the, the decision comes down from the court, it will be on the CCR website. And so I encourage people to keep an eye out on that. The other thing that I want to talk about is the resources that are available for environmentalists and animal rights activists who may get in trouble because of their, get into legal trouble because of their activism. Now, uh, I'm also a member of the National Lawyers Guild, as is everyone at People's Law Office. And the National Lawyers Guild has been really active around representing people under the Green Scare and particularly around the ATA and has ra have raised challenges about that. There's a Green Scare hotline. So this is a national 24-7 hotline for anyone who is served with a subpoena, who called to testify before a grand jury, or arrested and charged uh, under 
any of these terrorism statutes for environmentalism, the number there is 888-NLG-ECOL. And also for local activists, and there is a NLG Chicago hotline that is 312-913-0039. And there are lawyers here locally that are representing activists that get charged with these kinds of things. There's also an animal rights activism committee within the National Lawyers Guild, which was recently started at uh, the last National Lawyers Guild convention in October. And so if anybody is uh, interested in participating in that, any legal worker, law student, lawyer in the crowd who wants to become part of that, come talk to me afterwards and I can tell you more about the kind of work that's going on with the animal rights activism committee there. And finally, what I want to say is that it's really, there's a role for legal workers and lawyers to really challenge these things in the courts and that I, it's extremely important. But really the most important thing that you can do if you're interested in challenging these types of criminalization, these types of statutes, and these efforts by both private corporations and the government to lock people up is to exercise your First Amendment protected speech. Really, the best thing you can do is to advocate for animals and for the environment and to do that zealously and courageously and to keep doing the most you can to speak out and to challenge the corporations that are trying to destroy this earth. And that's the best thing that you can do for civil liberties and for the environment, for animals and for humanity. Thank you. <laughs>